Amen. I want to um, look at something different this afternoon. Um, so it's not directly connected to the great controversy studies that we're doing. I know at um, your fellowship that um, you've been going through the great controversy and I believe you're on chapter 40, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll already have cov covered chapter 38 some time ago. Um, <clears throat> so I want to look at the history of chapter 38 of the Great Controversy, but that chapter is quite long and I don't want to do it from that book. I want to go to another book, but it's the same history. So you'll remember at the beginning of the trimester, we compared two books. And what are those two books that we compared? One was the Great Controversy. Spirit of Prophecy Volume 4. Sorry? Spirit of Prophecy Volume 4. It wasn't Spirit of Prophecy Volume 4, no. Spiritual Gifts. Yeah, it was Early Writings. Mm -hmm. And Early Writings is a, a, essentially a compilation of a number of books, three books essentially. and. The one that we were focusing on is Spiritual Gifts Volume 1. Spiritual Gifts Volume 1 is one of her earlier works. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's 1857. Uh, I may be wrong on that, but it's, 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 it's early. And it's really, um, I'm pretty sure it's one of her earliest works uh, that deal with the subject of the Great Controversy. 1858. So, so I've already contended that uh, early writings that was published in 1882 becomes the book that the Lord is going to offer his people as they've forgotten these early works, going to compile all the information that they need to prepare them for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 1888. It comes just in time. Um, so that to me is the context or the justification for this reprint of these earlier volumes. Ellen White talks about the purpose of it, um, but she gives a more naturalistic or more realistic uh, reason that there were many people who weren't around in those early days. There weren't that many books that were published, they'd been scattered, so they wanted to bring all of that material together. And also another reason was that she was getting accused of a number of issues. <clears throat> and one of the major things that she was being accused of was time setting. Um, and so she wants to give evidence. She never time set. She never got into that kind of fanaticism. Um, and people were manipulating or misquoting from her earlier works. And because there weren't that many copies left 30 years on, there weren't that many published originally, what they wanted to do was collate those early volumes and have them reprinted so that everybody could see what she had said from the very beginning to that point in history. And her argument was that we had no new message. I'm not saying anything different today than I did before. Um, and I think I, I read something along those lines last Sabbath when I was reading from Life Sketches and there are a number of versions of Life Sketches. One of them is Life Sketches 80, and one of them is just the original Life Sketches. And in the original one, it says, I don't do this thing. And then another one, she says, I haven't done this for 30 years. I don't know if you remember me reading that. Um, and it's just showing the difference between when those two volumes were written. One was written in the 80s, and one was written in the 50s, essentially. Um, and that's the purpose of early writings. It's to bring everybody up to speed so everybody's reading from the same book. And as I say, she gives this um, comprehensive but very brief overview of the Great Controversy from the very beginning, uh, chapter one, the fall of Satan, to the last chapter, and they're not numbered in early writings, but they are in uh, Spiritual Gifts Volume One, uh, the second death. So it begins with the fall of Satan to the second death. And what I wanted to look at is a fairly short passage it's the equivalent of chapter 38 in the Great Controversy. And it's called The Loud Cry. 
So um, I didn't I didn't print it. I didn't have printouts for this. So hopefully someone's got access to a device. This is just early writings, page two hundred and seventy-seven, paragraph one. I think it's only four paragraphs. Yeah, I'm counting. Uh, yeah, I think it's four paragraphs. So all I want to do is basically read through the paragraph and just to draw out some information as much as we can see, attempt to put it on the line. The fundamental difference between, uh, maybe it's, that's not even the right way of expressing it, um, between Spiritual Gifts Volume 1, Early Writings and the Great Controversy, the 1911 version, is that it's, uh, the Great Controversy is a much more refined book. The way the chapters are laid out, the structuring, or the structuring of them, the grammar, it's all been tidied up, uh, as well as obviously being expanded as their knowledge base has increased. And we've discussed all of that in class. But what she tends to do in the Great Controversy, uh, particularly some of these later uh, chapters, she begins them with a key uh, Bible verse. So I think you've, you'll have seen this um, when you've gone through the Great Controversy. So I'll, I'll just give an example of that. So chapter 38 in the Great Controversy, I know I'm jumping back and forth from books. It's called The Final Warning. So if we parallel these two books, what is the final warning? So that, that's relatively straightforward, it's the loud cry. So all, all I'm doing there is using one of William Miller's rules, which is what? Maybe there's a couple of rules. If I were to ask you, uh, what does the final warning mean, the word final and warning, you'd naturally go to a dictionary to try and... So you'd use a dictionary to define these words. So what rule are we using? We haven't gone to a dictionary. We have three? Proof so, proof texting? Or number five. Okay. Rule number five. What's rule number five, Mr. Bromley? A summary of it without reading it. Scripture must explain itself. So, I'm going to change it to inspiration. Okay. Okay, so uh, scripture must be its own expositor. I think that's a, a rough approximation of what he says. So, I'm saying we're going to. We're going to allow inspiration, Ellen White, to define what she means. The final warning is the loud cry, if we're, if we're okay with that. So, obviously what I'm um, assuming, directing us into this study, is that the chapter titles, everything about these books is inspired, uh, divinely inspired. They're not just, you know, human creation. Everything's been checked and put, put there for a purpose if you're willing to accept that, I think most of us would be, that even the titles are correct, that they're what they should be. So the final warning is the loud cry. I'm not sure about this, but I think Spirit of Prophecy Volume 4 calls that same chapter the loud cry. Am I correct on that? I, th I think it is. Yeah. Uh, 4SP is an earlier work. I think it's 1884 that that yeah, book was written. Yeah, I think it's 1884. So you've got 1884, 1888, 1911. And the Spirit of Prophecy series has expanded the Great Controversy into a number of volumes now. Um, so we're going from the earliest work to one of the final works. And in chapter 38, it begins with a Bible verse. I think all of us are familiar with that Bible verse. It's Revelation 18, and it's verses 1, 2, and 4. And why is that significant? Why is that significant that she's going to quote 1 to 4 as a singular unit? What do we know about those verses, if, if we were to read them, particularly verse 1? 
uh, two, and then four. What is it, Tyler? There's two distinct calls in those verse, in the four verses. Two distinct calls. So I'm just going to just change that to say there's two voices. <coughs> if we're okay to express it that way. Uh, verse two, he cried mightily with a strong voice. Verse four, I heard another voice. So there are two separate voices. Everybody's okay with that? Um, just want to add one more piece of information there. That uh, verse one says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven. And then verse two says, he cried mightily with a loud voice. So verse two is the same angel as verse one. If we're, if we're okay with that. I think that's relatively straightforward. We're just reading the verse as it's given to us. So, the angel that comes down in verse 1, what angel is that? If verse 2 is the angel that says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Second angel, so we're okay that this is uh, the second angel's message. So she's going to introduce uh, the chapter that addresses the loud cry with the second angel's message or the second angel. She's uh, not going to give us verse 3 because verse 3 is just additional information about the extent of the darkness or apostasy that's existing. So she's just confiding herself um, to an overview of what's happening. Verses 1, 2 and 4. I don't want to make um, any application, but I just want to make an observation if you ever decide to look into this or study it. In Revelation 14, you see two angels. You, you, there's three, obviously. Uh, but we've got the first angel and the second angel. And where, where are those angels located? It's a simple question, it's not, we should all know it. Sorry? So they're flying in the atmosphere. This is the second heaven, uh, sorry, the first heaven, if we're okay with that. So they're flying in the atmosphere. This is Revelation 14. Yeah, that's straightforward. Revelation 10. Uh, I'm not going to prove this, but I would suggest that Revelation 10 is the first angel. I think most people, I don't know if anybody has a different opinion on that. In Revelation 10, where is this angel? This first angel, the same angel that was flying in heaven. So, if I can express it this way, um, by the time you get to Revelation 10, this angel has landed. It's now on earth. Uh, so, first it flies and then it lands. And when you go to Revelation 14, the second angel is flying. And when you get to Revelation 18, which is the same second angel, what's that, where, where's that angel now? Okay. It's the same place. So all I want us to see is that there's a relationship between Revelation 14, Revelation 10 and Revelation 18 about the location of those angels. They're the same angels, the first angel and the second angel. In Revelation 14, it's flying through the atmosphere. And in Revelation 10 and 18, it's now come to earth. So if you ever wanted to try and decode or decipher what that is teaching, I think it's a worthy study to do about the symbology of flying through the atmosphere and coming down to earth. Uh, so. If we go back to early writings, 277 paragraph 1. Oh, actually, no, let me just make another observation. Um, the next chapter, chapter 39, is a time of trouble. And in early writings, it's uh, called the time of trouble, same chapter. But again, in, that pa in early writings, she doesn't give Bible passages that introduce the subject. So you've got the time of trouble and the time of trouble. And in 39, you've got Daniel 12.1. So she gives you an, an anchor verse 
to guide and direct you. So coming back to early writings, if you are doing this with a device, hopefully, you'll see actually between the loud cry and the time of trouble, there's another chapter that she's tucked in there, uh, which is the third message closed. So she's got the loud cry and the third message closed. I don't know how easy this is to do on your phones. I don't think it's that easy. But if you have a laptop, it, it is relatively straightforward. I'm suggesting that the book, Spiritual Gifts, is a chronological um, explanation of the great controversy. And in prayer meeting, we've been discussing what chapter? Another, another no, not another. <laughs> The Advent Movement Illustrated, and the Advent Movement Illustrated is the Millerite history, and she goes through this history four times. She does it through the biography of William Miller, then the first and second angel's messages is the second time. The Advent Movement Illustrated, then another illustration. Then she, uh, the next chapter is the sanctuary, and what's the next one? The third angel's message. So what I want us to see is if we want to do a timeline according to early writings, we'd have the Millerite history here and when you get to October 44, what chapters uh, come after that? Okay, so it's the sanctuary and then the third angel's message, or the third angel. So, if, you, if we were to read this chapter, the third angel, I'll just read the, the introductory uh, sentences to that um, chapter. The third angel's message. As the ministration of Jesus, oh sorry, this is um, early writings 254. Early Writings 254, paragraph 1. As the ministration of Jesus closed in the holy place and he passed into the holiest and stood before the ark containing the law of God, he sent another mighty angel with a third message to the world. A parchment was placed in the angel's hand and as he descended to the earth, uh, sorry, as, and as he descended to the earth in power and majesty, he proclaimed a fearful warning with the most terrible threatening ever born to man. So, all I want us to see here is that connected to the sanctuary where Jesus moves from the holy place to the most holy place is the third angel and we would understand this to be the, the arrival of the third angel if we're okay with that this is the arrival of the third angel's message and then what she's going to do next is she's going to run you through the history of Adventism from 1844 to the end of the world essentially and she's going to do it through the following chapters she's going to speak about a firm platform spiritualism covetousness the shaking the sins of Babylon and then the loud cry the chapter that we're going to look at and I don't know if I'm sure we've all probably read these chapters before but when you begin to place them on a line and actually study them carefully you'll actually see the methodology that she's following as she takes us step by step through the great controversy as it ensues from October 1844 to the end of the world. Um, it ex it, when you do that, it explains what's happened to the world, it explains Satan's strategy to prevent God's people doing their work, it explains the problem that we got into and it explains the methodology that God's going to use to get us out of this problem and then it all culminates in this loud cry chapter. After the loud cry it says the third message closed. So all I wanted to, see or to show you on this line is that here after 
the loud cry chapter, this is the chapter called the loud cry, you see that the third angel's message is closed or ends. So this is the beginning of the third angel's message and this is the end of the third angel's message. That's all, that's what, all I wanted to see here. And what we're required to do is to take these structures, these lines, not this one but other ones that Ellen White creates for us and we then develop lines based upon these principles. Because what we do, and I think most of us realise, we're going to get the third angel that has been running through history for all these uh, years and we're going to have a fulfilment of this third angel later on in the history that we're living in. That's what this movement does. But the way we do that has to be based upon some kind of rule, some kind of principle, some kind of template, if you like. And I'm saying the template that we're using is the one given straight here from the great contra uh, from early writings. It's really easy to see in early writings because the chapter titles really guide you. So I'm saying the arrival of the third and the ending of the third gives you the structure of how to place the third angel's message in our own history. And um, she's, as I say, she's going to give us the third message closed and then you're going to have the time of trouble. So I'm just going to call that Jacob's time of trouble. You have the loud cry, third angel's message ends and Jacob's time of trouble. Now, when was this all written? I don't know if you remember. It's 1858. This is not 1882. It's not written that late. It's written very early. And if you've read these chapters before, what, what will you have noticed? I'll give you a clue because maybe you don't know what I'm asking. What do we call ourselves? What's our name? Adventists? Adventists? <coughs> Seventh-day Adventist. So the Adventist bit is good, but the Seventh-day Adventist bit. Now, this is written in 1858. I'll mark that here, 58. Ellen White's going to begin keeping the Sabbath in 46. So he's 12 years on. The Sabbath is reasonably well established by the time this book is written. But what is not established is the subject of the mark of the beast about the Sunday law and all the dynamics of of what that entails. That's why in this early work you don't see there's a, there's a focus placed upon the Sunday law um, or Sunday sacredness as there is in the Great Controversy. By the time you get to the Great Controversy years later this theology has been developed but here in this early work it, it isn't so the reason I mention that is that she can clearly mark the end of the third angel and she's going to mark the loud cry but she's not going to mark what starts off the loud cry now what do we mark as starting the loud cry? Sunday. we mark the Sunday law so I put that in parenthesis because in early writings you don't have that hook to uh, start the loud cry. She doesn't give you that. That's all I want us to see. That um, we have to go to the great controversy, we have to go to other places to connect the Sunday law to the loud cry. It's not in early writings. But the third angel's message is it's beginning and it's end. So one thing we know is that Um, let me just... check something. Yeah. If we went to the third message closed, that chapter, and I'm just going to read um, some just some highlighted portions. This is in the first three paragraphs. This is early writings 279. What I'm going to read to you is the following. When we went to the third angel's message here, 
What did she connect the third angel's message with? It's not the Sunday law. What's it, what's it, what's it hooked to? It's hooked to the sanctuary. I don't know if we, 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 we saw that. So she's hooked the third angel, its arrival to the sanctuary, where Christ goes from the holy place to the most holy place. And she's going to do exactly the same thing here, where she's going to end the third angel. So we're going to read this. She's going to go from the most holy place to, uh, I'll just put leaving, that Christ leaves. Um, 279 paragraph R, first sentence. I was pointed down to the time when the third angel's message was closing. The power of God had rested upon his people. They had accomplished their work. So I'll stop there. Next paragraph. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. An angel with the writer's ink horn uh, by his side. Where is that language taken from? A writer's ink horn by his side. So this is Ezekiel 9. If we were to go to Ezekiel 9, um, I think most of us are familiar with this. Uh, may, actually, let's turn to Ezekiel 9 because I want to make an observation here. We know that Ezekiel, like Daniel, has already been taken captive and he's in Babylon. Are we all okay with that? <coughs> the story of Ezekiel, the book itself, takes you through a transitional period pre-destruction into post-destruction. So it, it spans two dispensations, if I can put it that way. Just the book of da uh, Ezekiel in the general sense. So if I said Jerusalem, and this is marking the destruction of Jerusalem, Ezekiel looks like this. It's from before and after Jerusalem. Approximately, the book begins six years before the destruction, approximately. It's in the fifth year of the um, captivity of Jehoiakim. And if you took that as the first year of Zedekiah, Zedekiah reigns for 11 years, so 11 minus 5 is 6. It's not exactly, but it gives you a rough idea of where we are in the, in the scale of things. Almost exactly six years. It's not just approximately. Okay, so we'll go with six years. Um, Ezekiel 8, he's in Babylon and he's going to get lifted out of Babylon he's going to be taken back to Jerusalem and this is real life, I'm not saying he really gets taken back but it's in real time, that's what I want to suggest Ezekiel 8, where are these uh, people doing all their sins? We talk about the men bowing down, where is that all happening? It's happening in the temple, so I'm arguing that Ezekiel 8 is here before the destruction. He's taken into Jerusalem, it's before the destruction, and he sees all the wickedness that's happening there. And this is what's going to lead to the destruction of Jerusalem. Then you get into chapter 9, and in your Bibles, if you've got little subheadings there, um, if you, if you, most people who've got a study Bible, it will tell you there, and it's called the work of judgment. It's got, it'll mention something along those lines. Not all Bibles have these little subheadings. Uh, so I'll read verse 1. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And there were six men. So... I'm not going to read through the chapter. They're going to go and mark people, if you, if you were to uh, read that. And uh, then in verse 6, no, I'll go to verse 5, and it says, And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go after him through the city and smite, to hurt, to destroy. Verse 6, Slay utterly everybody. So, at least the first part of verse 9, 
Is that before or after the destruction of Jerusalem? This marking process. Before we can see that, so I'm going to put nine here. So eight and nine are before the destruction of Jerusalem. So I want to go back to verse one. This is, this is, I just want to make a simple point about what Ellen White did w that we just read. So this is Jerusalem. And what does verse 1 tell us? Sister Bromley, what does verse 1 tell us? You didn't see what chapter? Chapter 9, verse 1, I'm sorry. There's a loud cry. There's a loud cry. And everyone needs to have their destroying weapon in their hand. Who's who? Are, who is that? Everyone. I don't. I don't. I don't want application. Just in the story. The angels. Where are they? I don't think it says angel in there. Okay. It just says them. Where are they? Tell me where they are. They're outside of the temple. I don't know. It says city, does it say temple? Okay. So where are they geographically in, in relative to the city? In the city? Are they in it? If so they have charge over the city, then so they're they're, okay, so we'll we'll say that they're in charge. Where are they? So we've got they're in charge. How do you read when it says draw near? Coming up to. So where they're coming up to? The city. So what does that mean? That where they're must they be? Of the city. So they're outside of the city. So um, we'll see. I think it's in verse uh, two. Verse two. It tells you who they are. There's six of them. So there's these six people who are going to draw near to the city. If we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a rough approximation of what that verse is saying. And these six people, um, what role do they have? It says that they're in charge over the in charge of the city, and they've got destroying weapons. And this is before the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, so this Jerusalem is destruction. You've got six men who are in charge, and they're going to draw near to Jerusalem. So, should they all come from the north, according to the verse? Uh, we can put, I can put, have them all coming from the north, <coughs> if, if you like. I'll, have it, I'll just have it like that for the moment. Um, so, the question is, who are these uh, six people with the destroying weapons? It says six men with destroying weapons. Um, Sister Michelle, who would you say they are? Before you answer that question, I'll give you another question. What's their job function? Well, to charge over the city, I would think it would be to protect the city. So they're in charge. Mm. What else is their job function? Just read verse 5 and 6. To destroy. So their job function is to destroy. It says in verse 1, what have they got in their hands? Last part of the verse. Destroying weapons. So they're just there to destroy. Sister Rachel, I want to ask you a question. You've got some people who are in charge of Jerusalem before it's destroyed and their job function is to destroy Jerusalem. Who are these six men? I 
I don't know. You don't know? Keep your hand in here. Go to Habakkuk. Brother Graham, what chapter, what verse? Back at 2. Back at 2. Verse four. 2 verse 4. Sister Lisa, what chapter, what verse? Sister Tess? Brother Philip? Not sure. Okay. So I'll give you the chapter then. Chapter 1. Yeah. Sister Brittany, what verse? Six. Verse 6. So if you read verse 6, Sister Rachel, I'll read it out aloud. You read it along with me. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. So we'll come back to Ezekiel chapter 9. Who are those six men that have charge over the city and they're going to destroy it? So I don't know if we're okay with that. That these six men in this story are a symbol of Babylon as they come to destroy the city. They're already in charge of the city, we know that. Just historically we know they've been in charge of the city for a long time. They're going to destroy it and the only reason I uh, put them like this is because they're going to besiege the city um, to pin them down. So the only reason I mention that is because when you go to the third message closed in early writings 279 paragraph 2, she's going to take that story and She's going to make an application of it here in the end of the world where she talks about the sixth man, that one man with the ink horn, who's going to be marking uh, God's people. So I just want us to see how she can take Bible stories and make applications uh, in a way that would, she would find acceptable. Um, and we would too. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. But I just want to see that the original application, these, these six men are a symbol of Babylon and this angel here is certainly not a symbol of Babylon this is one of God's messengers here in this chapter so that, that wasn't anything to do with what we're studying I'm just saying that we could see the right zinc horn this is Ezekiel 9 you can see how she, how she uses applications here um, he returned and he said to Jesus uh, my work is done and the saints were numbered and sealed uh, 279 paragraph 2 early writings. Next paragraph, uh, 280.1. Every case had been decided for life or death. While Jesus had been ministering in the sanctuary, the judgment had been going on for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. Christ had received his kingdom, having made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The subject of the kingdom were made up, which is exactly what was mentioned before. Um, the marriage of the Lamb was consummated and the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven was given to Jesus. Next paragraph. As Jesus moved out of the most holy place. So that's what I want you to take from this chapter. The arrival of the third or the beginning marks the transition from holy to most holy. The end marks most holy to leaving. That's how she's going to explain the work of the third angel. And what we're left to do, you'll notice here that she said um, he'd been in the sanctuary first for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. So what, what we've been tasked to do is to work out how the judgment of the dead and how the judgment of the living works. Ellen White says no man, no human being can ever know that. They won't know. And What's our argument for that, that no man will ever know? For those of you who have been in class, maybe... Okay, we won't know when the judgment of the living begins. She says quite unequivocally. So how do we know? What, what, what arguments do we have that we'll know? I don't think that she says we, no man will ever know. Okay, so we, so we want to play with the grammar. I'm she okay says, with that. I don't she mean that says that... No, I, I don't want to go don't with know the grammar. When, when, when that will happen. 
like we now don't know when the Sunday law will come, but after it happens, mm -hmm. you can see that happened in the past. That was my argument. Okay, so once it's already happened, then we'll know. Yeah. That's your argument? Yeah. So the time's ready, then it's opened up? So the time's ready till it opens up, Sister Tess? We have to be in the time period of the opening of the judgment. Okay, so we read that quite clearly in class that you have to be, how did she say, talk about it? <coughs> what word did she use? Passed over the ground. Ground. Mm -hmm. You have to be walking along the ground while the special prophecies are being fulfilled mm -hmm. then you will receive this special light about what the fulfillment of the prophecy means. So you have to be in that history. So that's the first thing. And, t and if you're not in the history you'll never know. So we, 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 we understood that what else? Any other? <coughs> any other arguments? One more argument that we had. Um, I'm going to just put walk. Walk over the ground. What's the other argument? That we covered in this trimester. Yep. <coughs> did we cover the scattering and the gathering? Uh, we, we did, but that is that was this would be a gathering time period. That would be the ground. If we're going to do scattering and gathering, when you're in the gathering, then you know. So you have to be in that history. So we've we spent a lot of time doing this. What we've been studying the last I don't know week. Sorry. What is a prophet? What is a prophet? So let me read something to you. Um, it's not in the document, what is a prophet, um, but it should be, only because I added to it. Um, so we got to, um, I think the last one we read was Signs of Times, February the 3rd, 1890. We read that one. So there's another one, and most of us are familiar with it, because I've spoken about it, not this trimester, but in other places, and people have heard that. This is Gospel Workers, page 13. Gospel Workers, page 13, and it's a really interesting statement. I, li I like this one. In every period of this earth's history, God has had his men of opportunity, to whom he has said, you are my witnesses. In every age there have been devout men who gathered up the rays of light as they flashed upon their pathway and who spoke to the people the words of God. Enoch, Noah, Moses, Daniel, and the long roll of patriarchs and prophets. So she lists four. And then she says, not just for, it's everybody. These were ministers of righteousness. They were not infallible. It's a double negative. If I said, you're not infallible, what does that mean? You're fallible. So I'm going to change that. They were fallible, they were weak, and they were erring. But the Lord wrought through them as they gave themselves to his service. So um, she mentions four people. Enoch, Noah, Moses and Daniel. We'll just take two of them, Moses and Daniel. So how many of us would um, get into an argument with an atheist or a, um, a Muslim and their arguments is going to be, you know, there's lots of mistakes here, however they were caused. And we're saying, no, um, Moses and Daniel, they didn't make any mistakes. I mean, we're going we're gonna to stake our lives on that. I presume. We're going to go to Deuteronomy 1818 18, and we're going to have that as an anchor for us and say 91, 92. We know there was an increase of knowledge in our movement which has created all of this facility, all of us being here. So we place a lot of emphasis on the uh, fact that these men don't err, they don't make mistakes. Agree with that? Yeah, this is the inspired word of God. But she's telling you that Moses and Daniel were fallible, they were weak and they were erring. So when she says no man can know when those things are going to happen, the first thing is you have to be in the history before you can know. So we'll put, we have to be in the gathering. And the other point I want us to see is of profit. Or we could use the word servants, which is what we got from Great Controversy chapter 19. Here she uses the word ambassadors, we've used that word as well. These messengers from God, 
these messengers, these ambassadors, these servants, they know as they walk through this, uh, across this ground, they're given the revelation as the special prophecies are being fulfilled, light's given to them, and they know. Normal people will never know when that is going to happen. So, no truth is more clearly taught that God, through the Holy Spirit, sends servants here on earth to instruct his people. I need help remembering the quote, but I vaguely remember we read it in the last week or so. But she says something like, and it's inferred that the work that God's servants do, or, or they're not located on earth, but they're in heaven, something to that effect. Um, I'm hoping you can remember the one I'm thinking of, or the idea. But basically it was that when they were doing, when they're not located on earth. Like these humans aren't in earth, they're in heaven, based upon their, the job function that they're doing. I, I don't remember exactly. I can't remember the quote, but I think I remember that paraphrase. Uh, Sister Tamina? Uh, no, it's Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Okay, so pulling out of that, if we go back to early writings, I just wanted us to see how, you know, we can develop a logic to know how to create or where to place Sunday law. That's, uh, sorry, this is the judgment of the living. And, um, and my argument is that the Sunday law is the judgment of the living. This is what marks the transition point from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living. Ellen White doesn't say explicitly, but when you tie up all the pieces, all the threads of her argument, you find that's what it is. When we mark it at 9-11, we we're going back to the level of a fractal to be see when that process actually begins. Because uh, Ezra had three messages, or three, no, speak three up. degrees. Yeah. Speak louder, sorry. Because yeah. Ezra had three degrees in his hand, is that about have to do with that? I don't know. Let's go through, let's go through this chapter. Okay. Otherwise I'll get sidetracked. Uh, so back in the loud cry uh, chapter. Uh, this is 277 paragraph 1. Uh, before we read, um, I think Sabbath is about coming. Yeah? If we could just pause for prayer. Let me, let me just briefly address your question. I'm not going to answer it directly, Sister Karen. Um, if we draw the line for the final generation, if I can express it that way, you can get that concept from Matthew 24. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And we were to begin this at 1989 and close it at the second advent. There are a number of key waymarks that we can pick up. Uh, we've got a couple of them here. These ones here. Um, this would be Daniel 12.1 by the way. I didn't put that here. I should have put that. That would be Daniel 12.1. We can get that straight from early writings. And Ellen White's clear in the Great Controversy chapter that it's, she actually quotes Daniel 12.1. She actually quotes that there. Um, so you've got the second advent. Then you've got um, the close of probation. Jacob's time of trouble, which we've got here. The Sunday law. And we've got one more major waymark. What would, what would, what would that be, Sister Carrie? 9-11. That would be 9-11. Um, I don't know how many of us have uh, looked at studies that do with an agricultural cycle, but if we were to overlay an agricultural cycle here, you'd go to Hosea chapter 10, Jeremiah chapter 4, Matthew 13, uh, today's Sabbath school, Mark chapter 4. So there are four chapters, Hosea 10, Jeremiah 4, Matthew 13, and Mark 4. Hosea 10, Jeremiah 4, 
Mark 4 and Matthew 13. They're not, they're not the exclusive chapters, but those four chapters would help you to develop a line which would be an agricultural cycle. And if we were to do that, what we'd see is that from 1989 to 911, it would be a ploughing. 9-11 uh, to the Sunday law would be the former rain. 9-11 would be the sowing of the seed. And Sunday law to the close of probation would be the latter rain. And then close of probation to the second advent would be the harvest. So I don't know if you're familiar with, with, with that modelling. I think most of us are now, I know it's been around for quite a while. Once you can develop that line, what it shows clearly is the relationship between 9-11 and the Sunday law. If we could see that. If we were to expand this line out to this kind of scale, as Ellen White would do, Millerite history, the arrival of the third, goes all the way through to the third message closing. So this would be the line of the time of the end, finishing of everything. Uh, in the scale of the Gospels to the end of the world, this would be, um, if I just put the history of the cross like that, just in a generic sense, and this would be our history, and I just put SDAs, she would call this the history of the former reign, and this would be the latter reign, or this would be the sowing time, and this would be the harvest time. She can do it at this huge scale, which is 2,000 years. You can do it at a smaller scale, and you can do it at an even smaller scale. So we've got former rain, latter rain. Now, what she does interestingly is, she says this was the former rain, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with Acts of the Apostles, uh, it's around page 55 and onward. When she marks this, she says, this was the former rain, Pentecost. This is Pentecost. What does she say about the Holy Spirit's work after Pentecost? Sorry? Sorry? After start. Pentecost. Isn't it the start of the work of the Holy Spirit? So she says, when he came here at Pentecost, even though you had this sort of bright flash of light, she says it didn't go away. The Holy Spirit remained all the way through history. It's never left us. Inferring that even though this is the former rain, the former rain didn't stop here, and you've got 2,000 years of blank space. The former rain is all of this history leading you to the latter rain. So even though she's going to punctuate it here, saying it's Pentecost, she says it never left us. She's quite explicit about that and it runs all the way through. So, if this was Pentecost, then I'm going to take this out and make this the history of the cross and I would do this and make this a preparation. And I'll do this really simply. The three and a half years of training of the disciples, what was that? It was preparation or training. So you've got preparation, then you've got Pentecost, and, and your former reign in it never ends. So I'm not being accurate about the way marks themselves, I just want us to get an idea that this agricultural cycle fits here. Uh, when she talks about the latter rain, what she ends up doing is she sort of just interchanges latter rain and harvest at the end of the world and just makes it one thing, latter rain and harvest, just like that. She just makes it one thing. So latter rain and harvest. Is that good to do that, latter rain and harvest? Or is it confusing? Because we do the same thing all the time. What day number is this? If it's the Sunday law. If we're in the day of the Lord's preparation today, what day number is this? Seven. This is the day number seven. And what day number would this be? So I'm saying it's day number seven. There is no day number eight. You only go to seven and then the cycle stops. Um, and we could show that because when he puts his hand on the scapegoat, you're still there on that same day. The day hasn't changed. And that happens here in this history. He puts his hand on the scapegoat when he comes out of the sanctuary. It's still that day of atonement, same day. So I'm, all I'm showing you here is that the Day of Atonement has got two parts to it. 
if we, if we want to express it that way. It's got an investigative part and it's got an executive part. So it's got two parts. And you can see it's laterain and harvest. So when she sort of just melds them into one, it's really one day. Now when we talk about the day of the Lord, whether you go to Isaiah or Zephaniah, we often mark that it's the Sunday law, don't we? We always say that's the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's vengeance. But the day of the Lord is in two parts. There's vengeance from close of probation, the seven plagues, but the day of the Lord began before that. And, and we often don't, we just sort of meld them into one. Just like Ellen White would do here. She just says at the end, it's kind of latter rain and harvest. We just stick them together and just make them a singular thing. We do the same thing. That's all I wanted us to see. So it's not any different. Um, so if we wanted to go from this history here, we've got the Millerite history, 1798 to 1844, and then we've got this that, that we've got here, which is the loud cry, and then Jacob's time of trouble, the second advent, the close of probation, and I'll put Sunday law. She doesn't tell you it's the Sunday law because she doesn't give you that information in early writings. So I'm saying this line here would be the same as this line here. So I would argue that this would be the former rain, latter rain, harvest, and this would be the preparation. And when the Millerites came in 1798, what was their message? Sorry? Preparation. Preparation, but what was their message? First angel's message. First angel's message. And what's the purpose of the first angel's message? It's to prepare for the judgment. We agree with that? So you've got 46 years to get ready. So the judgment that you need to prepare for, so the hour of his judgment is come, it's talking about this one here. What judgment are they supposed to be preparing for? Investigative. For the investigative judgment. So I put J-I, uh, judgment investigation, the investigative judgment. So that's what they were preparing for in that history. So if we take this scale and bring it into our own history, you can see that this back end is the same. In fact, Ellen White gives us all of this information. And she says, from 1844 all the way to the Sunday Law, we need to be getting ready and preparing for this event. And she'll tell you in many different ways that this history here is character development or getting your life straightened with God. Um, and what happens here in the latter reign? She, I, I don't, yes, uh, but... Selection. Sorry? Selection. In the context of what I've just said, this is the time where you need to get your characters straightened out and developed. She says in the, hist in the time period of the latter reign, it's too late to do that. You won't have an opportunity. She says many people are waiting for the refreshing to get their lives in order. And that should all have been done in the former reign. So I'll give you an example of that, of how that would work. So one that we're all familiar with. Remember I drew this big line, 2000 years line. Remember we did that? So this was the former reign here. And this was the latter reign. And this was the uh, the disciples, and this is us. In this history here, on Resurrection Day, what happens on that Sunday when Jesus meets his disciples? What does he do? Breathe he breathes upon them. So um, I'm going to put that's the former rain, the breathing. Mm -hmm. And what's the purpose of that breathing? <coughs> we, we, there's nothing new, we teach this all the time. What's the purpose of that breathing? What are they able to do after that? Sorry? Can't be said that they preach. It, no, it doesn't help them to preach. Oh, yeah. They understand. It's prepared them to understand what? It's I can't hear you if someone's saying something. Mm. I heard voices, but they're not loud enough for me to pick up. Prepares them for Pentecost? Yeah, but what is the preparation? 
So we prepared them for Pentecost. What now do they understand? The scriptures. Prophecies. They understand the scriptures, the prophecies. So Jesus for 40 days is going to train them in a way that they haven't been able to comprehend before because they were mistrained. Yeah? They had a wrong training. And now he's going to, now they're ready to listen to him. So this former rain, this breathing, is to teach them prophecy. Or what we might call the methodology. They're going to learn the ABCs of how to read the Bible. And then when you've got Pentecost, Pentecost is the latter rain. And what's the purpose of Pentecost? Witnessing. Witnessing, or what we would call evangelism. <laughs> so the latter rain is evangelism. So if you just take that model and bring it to the end of the world, here at the end of the world, the latter rain, the outpouring here, what's its purpose? Evangelism. This is evangelism. And this one? is prophecy to prepare you for this event so you know how to preach properly, how to teach properly. So this is preparation or what we would call prophecy. So now we might ask how comes there's two preparations but they were with the disciples. There was this three and a half years of preparation then they had 40 days so that the preparation in this history if I, if I divide that into two like this this is the three and a half years and this is the 40 days. That preparation is different to this. This one, you know, they're going through things but they're pretty clueless. Um, they're broken at the cross. Once they're broken at the cross, now they understand prophecy well. And you could take that same dynamic here. Yeah, we're broken here in our history. Um, at, this, at this level, we're broken here. So then we uh, understand prophecy and then we get the latter rain. So I take this one and bring it here and all we've done is we've just taken these way marks and condensed them into a history that's talking about the final generation and they become 1989 and 9-11. Do you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, you have the 46 years and Jesus compare how you build the temple 46 years and three days you're going to we built something, John 2.20, and there you have three and a half years with the disciples and the 46 years of 1798 to 1844, just to make the parallel. Great. So this is how we've made our line, and you can run an agricultural model over it. So <coughs> Sister Karen was asking, what about 9-11? So 9-11 is an interesting way, Mark, because if you go to... Um, Chapter 8, Growing Up Into Christ, of Steps to Christ, Steps to Christ, Chapter 8, Growing Up Into Christ, she explains that the, when the seed is sown and it germinates, it's the same thing as what? It's the same thing as the new birth. So this is where you're born again, or new birth. And you can start bringing many Bible passages into this. This is why we mark baptism here. This, we normally do it in another, you know, using another methodology um, because we're going to put the arrival of the second angel here. We're going to put the baptism, AD 27, because Jesus is the second angel and he arrives on the scene right there at the cross, sorry, at the baptism. So this is marking when God's people come alive. Um, you get to Ezekiel 37 to show that. So it's this. The fact that we're alive here, that we're marking as the beginning of the judgment of the living, if I can explain it that way. That's why I would explain what 9-11 is in reference to the judgment of the living. Did that... It doesn't fully answer your question because there, there are things maybe... No, the things I haven't explained in that, but I just wanted to show how we have 9-11 on this line, why we'd mark something about living people here and if that were true and I was going to put Ezekiel 37 is everybody okay wh why I put Ezekiel 37 there some of the reasons for that it's the four winds that are prophesied to um, and we mark the four winds here at 9-11 if you're okay with that 
then I would ask you a question, Sister Karen. When it says alive, it's a multiple choice, is it literal or symbolic? When we talk about the judgment of the living, this living who is alive, are they literal or symbolic? Both. Both. Everybody okay with that? Can't just be literal. Because this person in 1999, were they alive? Literally. They were literally alive there, but this model says that they're dead. So when we talk about the judgment of the living, we can't just think in the context of people who are literally alive at the end of the world. And even though we may not fully understand the implications of that, it, has, it, has, it does have a huge implications of what we're actually teaching. And I think sometimes we don't realise that. Because we just say, if you're alive in this history, everything's okay. You know, because you're, you're part of this group. But we're not really teaching that. We're teaching something about this generation, this period of history, of Earth's history. But we're talking about alive, um, really about at a symbolic level, not at a, a literal level. Um, as I say, that has uh, implications of what we're doing. That's why we're picking up 9-11. It's when we're marked as being symbolically alive, if I, can ex if I could express it that way. But it doesn't undo the concept of the Sunday law here. Because that's what Ellen White's going to give us. She's going to mark this um, way mark. Does anybody have any questions on that? Sorry. I was going to ask if the three and a half years of the disciples before the cross is the ploughing. Yes, that's what I was indicating. Yeah, because if this is the former rain, the latter rain, uh, it would be that period, yeah, this, this time period of preparation because it begins at the time of the end where ploughing begins. So if we come back to 277 paragraph 1. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth, and again ascending to heaven. What does that sound like when you've got angels ascending and descending? So that sounds like Bethel, Jacob's ladder. So um, I'll take this out. We'll put a line and it says angels going up and going down. It's going to tell you what these angels are doing as they're going up and down. So are angels hurrying to and fro from heaven, uh, descending to the earth and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfilment of some important event. So what's the purpose of these angels coming up and down from heaven? Preparation. Preparation. So these angels are to prepare you uh, for what? So I'm going to put the event here. Do we agree with that? The angels are coming before the event. She hasn't told us what the event is. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth. We've discussed this in class, this word then. It can be used in, in different ways. It can be used sequentially. First I saw this, secondly I saw that. Or it can be two things that are happening at the same time. I saw this, and then at the same time, this was happening. It can be used both ways. So we have to determine how she's using it in this context. If she's using it at the same time or sequentially. So because we're, we're, we've run out of time, I'm going to tell you what I think, that this is sequential. It's first the angels are preparing, and then, then, it, then it says, Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. Great power and glory were imparted to, this, to the angel and as he descended the earth was lightened with his glory. So when it says the earth is lightened with his glory, that's a Bible verse. If, if you don't know, it, it is a Bible. What Bible verse is that? The earth is lighting with his glory. It's Revelation 18.1. So this angel, this mighty angel, 
is the Angel of Revelation 18.1. So I'm going uh, I'm to suggest that the important event that these angels are preparing for is at the same moment when this angel is going to come down. So I'm going to put this angel coming down here and I'm saying this is 18.1. And angel of, uh, the Angel of Revelation 18.1, what angel is that? So this is the second angel. And when he comes down, what's he going to do? He says, she says, um, to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. So the third angel has been running through history. We're already in the history of the third angel. She's told us that contextually because the third angel came about five chapters before here. So the third angel has been running through history and at this moment this angel here is going to unite with this angel here. So you're going to get the second angel's message uniting with the third angel's message. If we're okay with that. And when he does this, it says, unite his voice with the third angel's message and give power and force to his message. So, what's happening to the third angel here? It's getting empowered. So, there's some kind of power or empowerment of the third angel that's being marked here. I just want to... Um, make a point, if this was the arrival of the third angel back here um, and we already know that the third angel's message ends here what would we call this event here when it's ending? He says as the third angel is closing or the chapter says the close of the third angel close of So it's the close of probation with respect to angels would this be 3E? What would, what would we mark that as? Mm. Just want us to think about that if we'd mark this, if this was 3A what this would be? Next sentence, great power and glory were imparted to the angel um, and as he descended the earth was lightened with his glory. We read that, sorry. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere as he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of the devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So you, you know this is Revelation 18 because she's quoting Revelation 18 there. It's not Revelation 14, it's Revelation 18, version of the second angel. And his voice is getting pen. it says he's, um, his, the light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere. So there's this light here that I've got and it goes everywhere. So I'm saying it's worldwide. The message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. So what's she doing there? We're back on this scale now. Um, I'll get that one and I'll redraw it here. We've got the Millerite history and we've got this history. This is the event and this is 18-1. I'll put 1 to 3 and this is Millerite history and what's she marking? She said the second angel if you, if you, if you read it. She said the second angel in 1844. So this is 1844 and we've got the second angel and this is Revelation 14 so what she's doing is she's saying the angel of Revelation 14 Babylon is falling is now going to be repeated here so that's, her, that's her, the reference point it first came to earth here and now it's coming here when it came in 14 it was circling the earth when it comes in 18 uh, it's landing on the earth, it's touching the earth. The work of this angel comes in at the right time 
to join in the last great work of the third angel, third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. So this event, when it comes down, she says this is the right time. And what makes it the right time? What's about to happen? It says the third angel um, to join the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. So it comes just when the third angel's message begins to swell to a loud cry. So I've, I've, I've marked this in two ways. I've marked this escalation or this swelling and I've put the loud cry. And it says uh, the loud cry of the third angel. What is the third angel's message? Essentially. Judgment. Sunday law. The whole the bridegroom cometh. Sorry? The whole the bridegroom cometh. The third angel? That's the second coming, isn't it? Sister Alyssa? You said? Don't receive the mark. Okay, so it says, uh, don't receive the mark of the beast or you will die. Judgment's going to happen. You will, that's what that judgment is. You're going to die if you receive the mark of the beast. And when's that message going to be given? Here at this loud cry. It's the loud cry of the third angel. It's been given all along its history, but now it's going to give this same message with a cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation which they are soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them, and they united to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. Now this hour of temptation, it's, I'll read that again. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. So this is the last work. I'll put last. Work of the third angel. Because when you get to here, we read that the third angel is closing up its work. So this is the last great work of the third angel. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation which they are soon to meet. What is the hour of temptation that she's referring to? Sunday law? Persecution. After close of probation. Close of probation. Persecution. Persecution. Time of trouble. So we've got different answers about what this hour of temptation is. When it says, um, Brother Daniel, when, you, when it says, um, thus, and the people of God are thus prepared to stand, what does it mean? What is the dust that helps them to uh, be prepared to stand? What is the dust? Dust means in, in this way or in that way. Okay, in what way are they prepared to stand? What is the dish that's going to make them stand? That would depend on, on that previous sentence there. It would seem like it would be a third angel's message. Okay, so the last great work of the third angel? Mm -hmm. So the last great work of the third angel is going to help them to be able to stand in the hour of temptation which is still future to them. So I think what, tell me if I've understood what you said, that I'm going to take the loud cry out of the way mark and I'm going to put this swelling like this maybe I'll put it like this in this history here which is the last work of the third angel this history here thus in this history of this swelling it will help it will help prepare them to stand for the hour of temptation which they still have to meet because if this was the hour of temptation then the thus would have been back here but I think you said that the dust is in this history. Thus, in the sentence before, 
when this angel comes down with the swelling of the third angel, it's all of thus that they're able to stand in the hour of temptation. Which would mean that the hour of temptation would be here. Uh, if this was close of probation. I don't know if you see that. That would lend evidence maybe that it is a time of trouble then. Um, who had the hand up? Oh, it's me. I was going to ask what the last work of the third angel is, if that is the judgment of the living. So, the last work, we agreed contextually, it's this history. Again, it's just, she just calls it the event, because she doesn't, she doesn't talk about the Sunday law in this book. So, if this event is the Sunday law, and I'm saying that it is, uh, then the last great work is the closing work of the third angel, which back here I was arguing is the judgment of the living or the investigative judgment if we would if we could uh, use that um, term. Sister Alyssa? Wouldn't we say that the last great work is the actual giving of the message helping others? Wouldn't we say that the last great work of the third angel is actually giving the message and helping thus helping others prepare as we are preparing others, we are in turn preparing ourselves and doing this great work. I'm going to say no, okay. and the reason I'm going to say no, it sounds intuitive that it would be that, but our lines are counterintuitive. Um, sometimes we think all of our lines look identical and they're not. The line of the Levites and the Nethanims are not the same lines as we have. There are subtle differences, and those subtle differences uh, would make me answer to your question that it would be no. Um, let me just see if there's anything else I want to pick up from this before I move on. Um, I want to read from early writings. Now, uh, this is Last Day Events 186.5, LDE. And LDE 186.5, uh, sorry, 4 and 5, is two uh, early writings passages. It's uh, page 86 and 271. Early writings. So, um, th the first one. At that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the th uh, to give power to the loud voice of the third angel. So, is that what we just read here? Do we agree that that's what we just read? I'll read it again. At that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. So, this history here is to prepare you for the plagues. In, eight, in page 86, she says it's the plagues, but in the passage that we read um, from 277, paragraph 1, the loud cry chapter, she calls it the hour of temptation. So, the hour of temptation is uh, the plagues. Uh, Jacob's time was troubled, or seven plagues. So, I want to ask one question, if we... are happy with that, I, that model. This is the latter rain. Okay with that? What's the purpose of the latter rain, Sister Bromin? The, what we've just read, what's the purpose? So I'm going to say, latter rain equals... Ripen. Ripen. Another word, the one that she used. Prepare. prepare. So it's to ripen or prepare. And so my second question is, who? Brother Daniel? Who's getting ripened, who's getting prepared in this history? For this history? 
I was talking about the other Daniel. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> my, my fault. The 144,000. I don't know if we, if we can see that. But the purpose of the latter rain is not for the world. In this context here, as she's giving it, it's not for the world, it's not for the Nethanims. The latter rain is for the 144,000 to prepare them to stand for the hour of temptation. Live to see Christ coming in the clouds without, without, without seeing death. Yes. There's another group that have also been prepared. Who else is being prepared? The tares. The tares. And who are the tares? I can't go with false teachers. Who are the tares? Because because when I said who's being prepared, you didn't say true teachers. You said 144,000. Or you at least ascended to 144,000. So if the 144,000, uh, I'm going to change 144,000 to SDAs. 144,000 is a symbol in a particular context, but there are seven day Adventists. So who are the tares? Who are the people who are being ripened and for this period as well? Who are the other people? Non SDAs. Non SDAs. Nominal Adventists. Nominal Adventists. We we'll go with the world if you're okay with that. We could say the wicked, but if we said the wicked, I want to know well, who are the wicked. So I think we can conceptualize the world if we go with the world and SDAs or the church, the church in the world. So once we start thinking about it at this scale, we can then go back into our history right now and we can figure out what can we figure out? Who are the wheat and who are the tares? If you go back to the large scale, it defines who, who our target people are in our history. So we could think about that. And um, the work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus by this angel coming down. Uh, the third angel message escalating, they're now able or prepared to stand in the hour of temptation, Jacob's time of trouble, which they're soon to meet. They haven't met it yet. I saw a great light resting upon them and they're united to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. So I've taken out the loud cry for a purpose because I want to show us one more thing. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven. Who's the mighty angel from heaven? That's Revelation 18. So that's this one. I've got one, because that's what the angel is. But I'll put the three here. Because it, it tells you what he says. Now, it says angels are sent to help him. So I'm going to take this out. And so it says angels in the plural. Multiple angels are going to come down afterwards. And I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere. Come out of her, my people. So where's that? what verse is that? This is 18 verse 4. So 18 verse 4 is not 18 verses 1 to 3. These angels are not this angel. If we said these angels are just a cluster, just as a singular entity, how many angels have we now got in this history? Three. We've got the third angel. The second angel and these other angels. So I just want us to see that. Uh, this message seemed to be in addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. So she's now comparing this history here. This is one of our primary texts that we use. This is this loud cry and she's going to compare this to the midnight cry. And the midnight cry, what did it do? It joined what? It joined the second angel. I want us to see, and, and we, we saw this in uh, the prayer meeting study that we're doing, that these angels, these messages, or the message they're given, is separate and distinct from this angel. It's two separate messages. Whereas when you go to the first angel's message, the dynamic is different. I don't know if we remember seeing that. In our in prayer meeting, you've got when well, we marked this really clearly. You had the first angel, the first angel, 
And here you've got the first angel plus whom? Uh, it wasn't first because you weren't, I know you weren't here. Who is it? The people. Do you remember that? Here it's just the first angel. The first angel comes and then the first angel plus the people. This is 1798. This is 1840. Then we read what? We read the second angel. Then we read what? Angel. Then we said other angels come mm -hmm. plus the second angel plus the people. You'll see this, she's consistent in this, whether it's the great controversy, early writings, that uh, there's a difference between the first angel and the second. This is the second angel's message, and this is other angels or another message. It's not the same message. There's a, there's a difference when you deal with the first and second angels. Um, the glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints and they fearlessly gave the last solemn warning, proclaiming the fall of Babylon and calling God's people to come out of her that they may escape her fearful doom. What, what messages is that? It says, uh, The glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints. They fearlessly gave the last solemn warning, proclaiming the fall of Babylon. What one's that one? That's that one. Calling God's people to come out from her. That's that one. And that they might escape her fearful doom. Which one is the last one? You're pointing to 18.4. Okay. So, are we okay that's 18.4? Mm -hmm. So we've got, it's these two messages, the messages that we're going to give, which come in addition to the third angel's message. So we've run out of time, um, but I really want to uh, encourage you to if, if you read to the end of the chapter, uh, you'll see many more little nice gems that you, you may not have noticed before um, as you try to um, understand what the history of the loud cry is. And the reason for looking at this is because often we talk about our own history, history of the priest, and we haven't really looked closely at the history of God's people here at the, at the end of the world in this history here. And little things like the judgment of the living being marked here have obviously implications into our history, especially when you have to start factoring in 9-11 and how that operates and how the angels begin to interact with one another. So uh, I'm hoping that's relatively straightforward. It's just a, a basic reading of how Adam White structures prophetic history, how we structure prophetic history when we um, go back uh, from 1798 to 1844 and we bring it into our own history, 1989-911, how we bring in the agricultural cycle, um, what these angels are doing in aid or to help the third angel, how all of this work is to prepare us for Jacob's time of trouble. So the experience that we're now going through is a period of preparation to help us to get ready for the time period of Raphia because on this story here, if this is the second advent, this would be Raphia and this would be the second advent. Uh, this would be Panium and this would be Raphia. If I could just bring one more thought before we close. Why do we call Panium the second advent? What happens at the second advent? What's going on? Jesus comes back. Jesus comes back. Mm. So all the world is looking up and they can see Jesus coming. So what's that got to do with Panium? Sorry? Counterfeit. Counterfeit. It's a counterfeit. Mm. Someone said something? King of the North. King of the North. I want to suggest that the second advent here at Panium is the priests.
that where we perfectly reflect Christ and all the world sees us and all this work that's happening in between there, this is Jacob's time of trouble, the seven plagues, however they're going to be um, born out in this history, all of this leads to a place where everyone is going to be seeing the priests and the work that they do uh, for humanity. And then you can take this history, bring it into the history of the Levites, and you'll see that the role they play, again, when they're lifted up uh, before the world. So I, I want to suggest that uh, this second advent here is the priests. And just one more uh, point, that when we spoke this morning about the special resurrection, who's going to be resurrected here? The living testimony. Sorry? The living testimony. Who gets killed here? If you, if you, brought, if you brought this as the binding off, and you're just going to do Daniel 10, who dies in Daniel 10? Daniel dies in Daniel 10. He's going to be, and what does he do when he dies? What does Gabriel do to him? Yeah? Daniel says, stand on your feet. Yeah. So he gets resurrected. So I'm saying the special resurrection here is a sim again another, a, a symbol of the priesthood. Uh, in closing, <laughs> this morning you placed the, the lifting up or the raising even shortly before the close of probation. Who did? You. When? Was it or was it last night? I, can't I didn't remember. speak to the. I didn't say anything today. <laughs> You have to do that someone else. Like you, you mentioned that the inside probably is even lifted up even shortly before the close of probation. Let me say one thing to that, if you're willing to see this. Uh, the first angel's message is fear God, give glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. If you take the sanctuary model, it says what? Justification, sanctification, glorification. There's glory in two places that are out of sync with one another. And uh, if you remember the studies that we did last fall, we addressed this very subject of why you have glorification in two steps. They're marking two different experiences. Um, so that would be my answer to you, why you would see glory before and after the close of probation. It's, it comes up twice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your goodness and mercy, um, for your watch care over your people and the protection that you afford us. As we enter into this new week, we want to ask for a special blessing upon us as we continue to open and study your word. We want to ask for protection for this week. We don't know the, the dangers that are, are lurking ahead of us that we're not aware of. We ask for special care and protection. We know that there are brethren amongst us who are not well, um, we ask, Lord, that you would be with them and help bring healing to them. We know that brethren are leaving this evening when we'd ask for special travelling mercies for them. For the rest of us that remain here, we ask for continued grace and strength. Give us rest this evening so that we might be prepared to work for you tomorrow. All these things we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen.